Hello there. Welcome back to Jenny Designs with Paper and this week's episode of Crime and Coloring, where we take an alphabetical journey through the United States and revisit some of the earliest crimes. But before we talk crime, let's talk coloring. I purchased this Gina K Designs um, Bunches of Love stamp set that I will be coloring. I am going to color the flower bunch and add the stems. I have a selection of a more muted color palette for the flowers. I have two colors for the flowers and a green for the greenery. I will be coloring on Nina Classic Crest Solar White 80 pound cardstock. I will stamp it with Simon Says Stamp Intense Black Ink because it is a Copic friendly ink. It did take me a hot minute to figure out how to get this image prepared to stamp. I did end up having to do a partial mask on the flower bunch and then add the stems in in order to make it um, look right. <laughs> I am going to go ahead and use one of the sentiments from this stamp set as well to create a card in the video. And now that we've talked about all of the coloring, I think maybe one thing to note is I started with the darkest and went toward the lightest because the flowers Sometimes I wasn't sure which petal went to which flower. So I started with the darkest, added in my shadows and worked out that way. So I think that is all about the coloring and we're just gonna hop right on into our crime. So our alphabetical journey this month takes us to New Mexico. Now the pathway to statehood was a long and arduous process for both New Mexico and Arizona. You see, in 1848, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was signed, and that ended the Mexican-American War and allowed for the New Mexico Territory to be annexed into the United States. However, there were disputes regarding the state constitution, the state boundaries, slavery, and even the people in the state prevented the movement towards statehood. So eventually, and finally, on January 6th, 1912, yeah, do that math, that's a bit of a time period, like 50 years-ish, New Mexico became the 47th state admitted to the Union when President William Taft signed the, Mexican, the New Mexico Statehood Bill. And 39 days later, Arizona became the 48th state to join the Union. So just a little bit of background on the state of New Mexico. New Mexico has more PhDs per capita than any other state. And while Denver, Colorado may be described as the Mile High City, it has got nothing on the capital of New Mexico. The city of Santa Fe is stands at elevation 7,199 feet above sea level. You can see five different states from the top of the Capulan Volcano. Santa Fe was actually founded 10 years before the Pilgrims landed in Plymouth. Doc Holliday was once a dentist in Las Vegas, New Mexico, where he shot a guy and then moved on to Arizona to hang out with Wyatt Earp. About 75% of New Mexico's roads are unpaved. New Mexico has more cows than people. It is the home to the largest hot air balloon festival in the world, which is something that's totally on my bucket list. And you cannot legally dance while wearing your sombrero in New Mexico, so don't even try. And none of that has anything much to do with our story today, but I could not really talk about crime, criminals, and New Mexico without talking about the Lincoln County Regulators and the Lincoln County War. So let's talk about these regulators for a minute. The Regulators was a group formed out of uh, numerous small ranch owners and cowboys in the Lincoln County, New Mexico area. And this is prior to statehood. This is when New Mexico is still a territory. Many of those who became best known as the Regulators had a long history with each other. Um, some of the members, Abe Sanders, Charlie Bowdry, Doc Skurlock, Frank Coe, and George Coe, had previously worked as cattle rustler hunters. So cattle rustlers are cattle thieves, and cattle rustling and horse, horse rustling is a hangable offense in the Old West. 
One other thing to note is that at this point in time in Old Western history, there's a very fine line between criminal and lawman, or criminal and not criminal. And sometimes the man with the sheriff's star was not always on the right side. So just a thing to note as you as we travel through the Old Wild West. On July, July 18, 1876, there was a group of these regulators that stormed the Lincoln County Jail and removed from said jail a horse thief named Jesus Largo, and they hanged him. Um, about that same time, two of the regulators, Abe um, Sanders and one of the co-brothers, tracked down another cattle wrestler named Nikos Maris and shot and killed him somewhere near the mouth of the Baca Canyon. So these men, while they were not necessarily on the wrong side of the law, definitely um, didn't pull punches. Okay, and that's kind of the, the theme of the Old West. It was defend or lose, I guess, in those days. Lose your property, lose your livelihood, lose your things. The Lincoln County War was an Old West conflict between rival factions that began in 1878, and it continued through the early 1880s. During November of 1876, there was a wealthy Englishman named John Tunstall who arrived in Lincoln County, New Mexico, where he intended to develop a cattle ranch, a store, and a bank, and he brought with him a partner, a young attorney named Alexander McSween, and another cattleman named John Chisholm. At that time, Lincoln County was already dominated both economically and politically by Lawrence Murphy and James Dolan. They were the proprietors of the L.G. Murphy and Company, which later became named James J. Dolan and Company, the only store in the entire county. Their corporation, the Murphy and Dolan Mercantile and Banking Corporation, monopolized the trade of the county. They controlled pricing. They made huge profits on their goods because they could set the price to whatever they wanted. They had a hand in nearly every economic part of the county, including loans to farmers and ranchers. The merchants, along with their allies, included some of the local law enforcement, and they became known as the House. Now, these factions were often delight, divided along ethnic and sectarian lines. The Murphy faction were mostly Irish Catholics, and the Turnstall faction and his allies were mostly English Protestants. So this does have a little bit of holdover from the mother countries, right? England and Ireland were often in conflict, especially between Catholics and Protestants. L.G. Murphy and Company lent thousands of dollars to the territorial governor and the territorial attorney general eventually ended up holding the mortgage to the company right? So John Turnstall learned that Murphy and Dolan had bought a lot of their cattle from cattle wrestlers, and they had been given or awarded a lucrative beef contract with the United States government to supply the forts and the, quote, Indian agencies with meat. The government contracts, along with their monopoly on merchandise and financing for the farms and ranches, allowed Murphy, Dolan, and their partner, um, Riley, to become very wealthy individuals. The main event that kind of triggered this conflict into a war was controversy over the disbursement of Emil Fritz's insurance policy. So Emil, maybe is how you say his name, Emil Fritz was a partner of the Lawrence Murphy or a partner of Lawrence Murphy. He belonged to the L.G. Murphy and Company. Okay, he was a member of the house. When he died in 1874, the executors of his estate hired a young attorney to handle the legal side of his, the disposition of his earthly goods, 
that young attorney's name, Alexander McSween, who was the attorney and partner of John Tunstall. Now, Alexander was hired to collect Emil's life insurance policy from the company. And when he did so, he refused to turn the money over to the, ex the executor of Emil's estate because the house, the Dolan group, right? They claimed that, let me get this, this is the right order. They claimed that there was a debt owed to them by um, John Tunstall. Okay. And Alexander was afraid that the executor of Emil's estate would would give the ha give the the house. I'm using air quotes like you can see me. Would give that corporation the money, whether the debt was legitimate or not. That's what he was afraid of. He also was aware, though, that this large corporation um, needed some cash flow, and so as a competitor because he was partners with John Tunstall as a competitor to this, this house corporation, he would really did not want to give them the funding that they um, needed, whether their claim was legitimate or not. He was trying to prevent that from happening. So this is where that tension between the established group, the house and the new group of people, the English man, you know, that, that tension now becomes a war and it is a bloody war. Let's talk about another man for a minute. His name was Patrick Floyd Jarvis Garrett, and he was born on June 5th in 1850. He was born in Chambers County, Alabama, and was the second of five children born to John Lumpkin Garrett and his wife, Elizabeth Ann Jarvis. Um, Pat, as he became known, had four siblings, Margaret, Elizabeth, John, and Alfred. And when Pat was just three years old, his father purchased the John Greer Plantation in Claiborne Parish, Louisiana, before the Civil War. So when the Civil War had come through and was won by the North, it destroyed the Garrett family finances. It, it, there was nothing left for them. Their mother, um, Elizabeth, died at the age of 37 in 1867 when Pat was just 17. And then the following year, his father died at the age of 45. So Pat and his siblings were children. Pat was 18. He had one sibling older than him. The rest were children. And they were left with nothing but a plantation and debt. $30,000 in debt. The younger children were taken in by relatives, but 18 year old Pat headed west from Louisiana and on January and, and left the plantation rather on January 25th, 1869. Now, his exact whereabouts for the next seven years are obscure. There's no, even in his own memoirs, does not talk about those years that I found. I'll say that, that I found. <laughs> um, in about 1876, he turned up in Texas hunting buffalo. And during that period, Pat actually killed a man, another buffalo hunter named Joe Briscoe. Um, there was no documentation on whether that was a defense kill or an accidental hunting kill. But Pat surrendered himself to the authorities at Fort Griffin, Te Texas, and the authorities declined to prosecute. So that leads me to believe it was either defense or accidental death. Eventually, the buffalo hunting in Texas died out, so Pat left and rode straight into the New Mexico Territory. He arrived at Fort Sumner, New Mexico, and found work as a cowboy for Pedro Menard Maxwell. Pat did get married. He, in fact, he married twice. His first wife died just 15 days after their wedding. And then he went on later to marry again and have eight children with his second wife. And I'm going to butcher her name and I apologize. Apollinaria, 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 I think, Gutierrez. I apologize for that 
terrible pronunciation. Anyways, Pat is establishing himself in New Mexico, and on November 2nd, 1880, this is in the middle of this Lincoln War, Lincoln County War, Pat Garrett was elected sheriff of Lincoln County, New Mexico, and he defeated the incumbent sheriff, George Kimball, in a vote of 320 to 179. Now, the election was in November, and Pat's term was not slated to begin until January of the following year. However, Sheriff Kimball appointed him as a deputy for the remainder of his own term. And this was about the time that Pat also obtained a deputy U.S. Marshal's commission, meaning he was allowed to change to chase and, and um, collect, capture, there's the word, capture criminals outside of his own county. That, that, that's a huge thing right there. We have one more character in our story to talk about, and this is a young man named Henry McCarty. Now, Henry McCarty was born to parents of Irish Catholic ancestry, Catherine and Patrick McCarty. One, there is some confusion about the month of his birth, but one record states that he was born in September, on September 17th of 1859 in New York City, and he was baptized Patrick Henry McCar McCarthy at um, the Church of St. Peter's on September 28th of 1859. And the confusion may come, stem from the fact that he had a brother born the following year. But because his baptism shows that he was baptized in September, it is likely that that September 17th is, in fact, his birth date. However, um, Catherine's husband, Patrick, passed away. So she packed up her sons, Henry and Jacob, I think, was the younger son, and moved them to Indianapolis, Indiana where she met a man named William Henry Harrison Antrim. So Catherine and her boys moved with William to Wichita, Kansas in 1870. And then they moved a few years later when, and eventually Catherine married William. And that happened on March 1st, 1873 at the first Presbyterian church in Santa Fe, New Mexico territory. And Henry and his younger brother, Joseph, that's his name, were witnesses to the ceremony. Shortly after that wedding, or, or shortly after their wedding, um, Joseph McCarthy began using the name Joseph Antrim. Sadly, on September 16th of 1874, Catherine died of tuberculosis, then called consumption. This was just a little more than a year, about a year and a half after her marriage to William. But William abandoned her boys, leaving them orphans. So Henry was 15 years old when he died. And I'm not sure exactly what happened to his brother Joseph during those years. But Henry met a woman named Sarah Brown. And she was the owner of a boarding house. And she agreed to give him room and board in exchange for work. But about a year later, Henry was caught stealing food. And then 10 days after that, Henry and a man named George Schaefer robbed a Chinese laundry and they stole some clothes and two pistols. Henry was charged with theft and jailed, but he escaped two days later and became a fugitive. While he was on the run, he located his stepfather and stayed with him until William threw him out. And, at that, and when William threw him out, Henry stole some clothing and guns from him as well. And that was the last time William and Henry saw each other. So after leaving William, Henry traveled south to the southeastern Arizona territory, where he worked as a ranch hand and gambled his wages in nearby gambling houses. So he's about 17 now. In 1876, he was hired as a ranch hand by a well-known rancher named Henry Hooker. During this time, our original Henry became acquainted with John R. Mackey, a Scottish-born criminal and former U.S. Calvary private who, following his discharge from the military, remained near the U.S. Army post at Camp Grant in Arizona. These two men became friends and started stealing horses from the local soldiers. And this is the time when Henry started to become known as 
Kid Antrim, taking his stepfather's last name. Now, the last, his name comes, that, that nickname Kid, came from his physical description. The Las Vegas, New Mexico D Gazette newspaper described him as about five feet eight or five feet nine inches tall, slightly built and lithe, weighing about 140 pounds, a frank open countenance looking like a schoolboy with a traditional silky fuzz on his upper lip, clear blue eyes with a roguish snap about them, light hair and complexion. He is in all quite handsome looking fellow, only imperfection being two prominent front teeth slightly protruding like a squirrel's teeth. And he has agreeable and winning ways. So it seems that while he was in fact a fugitive, he also was quite a handsome and likable young man. I don't know. On August 17th, 1877, Henry was at a saloon in the village of Bonita when he got into an argument with Francis P. Cahill, a blacksmith, who reportedly had bullied Henry on more than one occasion and had called him a pimp. In turn, Henry called Francis a son of a, I won't finish so YouTube doesn't flag me, and Francis then threw Henry on the floor. The two fought and struggled for Henry's revolver. Henry happened to get to the weapon first and shot and mortally wounded Francis. One of the witnesses to this fight said Henry had no choice. He had to use his equalizer. And that indicates to me that maybe Francis was quite a bit larger than um, Henry or Kid Atrum, Antrim as he's being called right now. Francis did die the next day. So Henry fled and then came back a few, late, few days later and was apprehended by Miles Wood, the local justice of the peace. And he was detained and held in the Camp Grant guardhouse, but escaped before the law enforcement could arrive. Henry stole a horse and fled the Arizona Territory and headed into New Mexico Territory again. And just because karma is funny, a, a group of Apaches stole a horse from him, leaving him to walk the many, many miles to the nearest settlement. When Henry arrived at Fort Stanton in the Pecos Valley, he was starving and near death, and he went to the home of a friend and Seven Rivers Warrior gang member, remember that group? John Jones. And John's mother, Barbara, nursed Henry back to health. After regaining his health, Henry went to Apache, Apache, Apache Tejo, Wow, sorry about that. A former army post where he joined a band of rustlers who raided herds owned by the cattle magnate John Chisholm in Lincoln County. After Henry was spotted in Silver City, his involvement with the gang was mentioned in a local newspaper. And at some time, at some point around this time, Henry began to refer to himself by the name William H. Bonney. So he is now on to his second alias. I'm going to continue to call him Henry, even though now he's going by William, because otherwise I confuse myself. Okay. After returning to New Mexico, Henry worked as a cowboy for English businessman and rancher, drumroll, John Henry Tunstall in Lincoln County. John and his business partners... The lawyer, Alexander, yep, 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 yep. They were opponents of an alliance formed by Irish-American businessmen, Lawrence Murphy, James Dolan, and John Riley. So here we are. Henry is now smack in the middle of this conflict-turned-war. By February 18th, um, by February 1878, um, Alexander, the attorney, owed eight thousand dollars to James Tunstall and James obtained a court order and asked the Lincoln County Sheriff William Brady to attach nearly forty thousand dollars of John Tunstall's property and livestock to Alexander's debt. Now this goes back to that debt that I mentioned earlier with the um, life insurance policy of Emil. So a male had left the life insurance to John and Alexander. Alexander reportedly owed Murphy and Dolan $8,000 and they got the court to attach 
$40,000 worth of, of property and livestock from John to Alexander's debt, a debt of $8,000. <sighs> Seems like the law might not be on, you know, her blindfold slipping there just a little bit. I'm just saying. John Tunstall put Henry in charge of nine prime horses and told him to relocate them to his ranch that was about 70 miles outside of town for safekeeping. Meanwhile, Sheriff Brady assembled a large posse and then went to seize this huge amount of John's cattle in order to pay Alexander's debt. And the cattle vastly outweighed the debt that was reported to be owed. On February 18th, 1878, John learned of the posse's presence on his land and rode out to intervene. And during that encounter, one member of the posse shot John in the chest, knocking him off his horse. And then another member of the posse took John's gun and killed him with a shot to the back of his head. John's murder ignited this conflict. I mean, it was already getting hot and ugly. And now it is full on bloody war. And this is what is known as the Lincoln County War. This conflict, this harassment, this um, gunfighting between these two groups of ranchers. Now, after John was killed, Henry and his friend Dick Brewer swore affidavits to the Lincoln County, or swore affidavits against Lincoln County Sheriff Brady and those in his posse. And they were actually able to obtain murder warrants from the Justice of the Peace of Lincoln County, a man named John Wilson. So they went to the Justice of the Peace. They said, hey, the sheriff full-on killed John in cold blood, and they were given arrest warrants for him. So on the 20th of February, they are riding back into the fray, and they are going to, Henry and his friend, are going to arrest Brady for the murder of John when his deputies found and arrested Henry and the men riding with him. So it's just a hot mess right now, y'all. Um, Deputy U.S. Marshal Robert Weidenman was a friend of Henry's, and a detachment of soldiers captured um, the Sheriff Brady's jail guards and put them behind bars, and then got Henry and his friend Dick Brewer and the men riding with them out of jail. And this is the moment in time when Henry officially joined the Lincoln County Regulators. On March 9th, they captured Frank Baker and William Morton, the two men who were accused of killing John. Baker and Morton were killed while trying to escape, allegedly. <clears throat> On April 1st, this is all the same year, 1878, the regulators ambushed Sheriff Brady and his deputies. Henry was wounded in the thigh during the battle. Um, Brady and his deputy sheriff, George Hindman, were killed. And then on the morning of April 4th, 1878, Buckshot Roberts and Dick Brewer were killed during a shootout at Blazer's Mill. So warrants were issued for several participants on both sides, and Henry and two others were charged with the killing of Brady, Hindman, and Roberts. So like I said, this is a bloody war now. This is not just a political, economic, let's go steal some cows war. This is a bloody war. On the night of Sunday, July 14th, Alexander, the attorney, and the regulars, regulators, excuse me, now a group of 50 or 60 men, went to Lincoln and stationed themselves in the town among several buildings. At Alexander's residence were um, Henry, um, Florence Chavez, Jose Chavez y Chavez, um, Jim French, Harvey Morris, Tim O'Follard, and Inigo Salazar, and, and others. Um, there was another group led by Martin Chavez and Doc Skurlock, and they positioned themselves on the roof of a saloon. Henry Newton Brown, Dick Smith, and George Coe defended a nearby adobe bunkhouse. On Tuesday morning, July 16th, the newly appointed sheriff, George Pepin, sent sharpshooters to kill Alexander and the defenders of the saloon. And the sheriff's men retreated when one of the snipers, Charles Crawford, was killed by Fernando Herrera. And then Sheriff Pepin sent a request for assistance 
to Colonel Nathan Dudley, who commanded the nearby Fort Stanton. And Dudley refused to intervene, but then later arrived in Lincoln with troops. And that arrival of the troops kind of turned the battle. Until that point, it seemed like John T Tunstall and his side were winning. But now with the troops, it seems like maybe the Murphy-Dolan faction is going to take the lead in this war. There was a shooting war that broke out on Friday, July 19th, and, Al and Alexander's supporters had gathered inside his home. Buck Powell and Deputy Sheriff Jack Long set fire to that home, and the occupants of the building began shooting out into the street. Um, Henry and other men fled the building when all the rooms but one were on fire, and during the confusion, Alexander McSween was shot and killed by Robert Beckwith, who was then shot and killed by Henry. So Henry and three of the survivors of the Battle of Lincoln were near the Mascalero Indian Agency when the agency bookkeeper, a man named Morris Bernstein, was murdered, and this was on August 5th. All four were indicted for the murder, despite conflicting evidence that Bernstein had actually been killed by Constable Martinez. All of the indictments, except for the one against Henry, were later squashed. On October 5th, a U.S. Marshal named John Sherman approached the newly appointed territorial governor, a formal Union Army General named Lee, um, Lou Wallace, and told him he had warrants for several men, including, quote, William H. Antrim, alias Kidd, alias Bonnie, but was unable to ex execute them because, quote, owning to the disturbed condition of the affairs in that county resulting from the acts of desperate class of men. Governor Wallace issued an amnesty proclamation in November of 1878, which pardoned anyone involved in the Lincoln County War since the death of John Tunstall. It specifically excluded anybody who had been convicted or indicted of a crime and therefore excluded William, a.k.a. Henry, who was now mostly known as Dun 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 Billy the Kid. That's right. I could not do a story about New Mexico and not talk about Billy the Kid. In February of 1879, Billy the Kid and his friend Tom O'Fallard were in Lincoln and watched as attorney Houston Chapman was shot and his corpse was set on fire. According to eyewitnesses, these two men were innocent bystanders that were forced at gunpoint by Jesse Evans to witness the murder. So, Billy wrote to the governor on the 13th of March with an offer to provide information on Chapman's murder in exchange for amnesty. Amnesty, sorry. Um, governor Wallace replied. He agreed to a secret meeting to discuss the situation. Billy met with the governor on the 17th of March. Um, during that meeting and in subsequent um, correspondence, the governor promised to protect him from his en enemies and offered him clemency if he would offer his testimony to the grand jury. On the 20th of March, the governor sent a letter to Billy saying that for, let's see if I can find the quote here. Um, in order to remove suspicion of understanding, I think it is better to put the arresting party in charge of Sheriff Kimball, who shall be instructed to see that no violence is used. So the governor wanted the sheriff to arrest Billy in order to keep him safe and so that's what happened. Billy agreed. He was arrested um, by Sheriff Kimball and a posse and taken to the jail in Lincoln County. On And that happened on the 21st of March. He kept his end of the bargain. He provided a statement and testified in court about the murder of Chapman. However, after his testimony, the local district, district attorney refused to set him free. He waited, Billy waited for several more weeks and began to suspect that the governor had entered or had used subterfuge and was never going to grant him amnesty. So Billy the Kid escaped. He escaped the Lincoln County Jail on June 17th of 1879. Now Billy goes quiet for about six months and there's nothing more violent from him until January of the next year, 1880, when he shot and killed a man named Joe Grant. The newspaper reported they didn't know um, exactly what the problem was, but other sources say that Billy had been warned that Joe was coming to kill him. 
So, in true Billy the Kid fashion, Billy walked up to Joe and said, Hey, I like your gun. Let me look at it. And Joe said, Sure. Check it out, big dummy. Um, but before returning the pistol, Billy noticed that it was only held three cartridges. So, Billy positioned the cylinder so that the next hammer fall would land on an empty chamber. And then he returned the gun. Joe then suddenly pointed the pistol at Billy's face and pulled the trigger. It failed to fire, because duh. And so Billy drew his own weapon and shot Joe in the head. A reporter for the Las Vegas, New Mexico Optic quoted Billy as saying about the encounter, quote, it was a game of two and I got there first. Um, also in 1880, Billy formed a friendship with a rancher named Jim Greathouse, who later introduced him to Dave Rudabaugh who was a member of another of these um, regulator gangs, remember? Um, on the 29th of November, Billy Dave and another man named Billy Wilson were running from a posse led by James Carlisle, who was a sheriff's deputy, and they ran to Jim's ranch house. Um, Billy told the posse that Jim was actually a hostage, and Carlisle, the deputy sheriff, offered to exchange places with him, and Billy's like, sure, come on in. Um, Carlisle, the deputy, later attempted to escape by jumping through a window and was shot three times and killed. That shootout kill, or ended the standoff. The posse withdrew, and Billy and Dave and Wilson rode away. A few weeks after this incident, Billy the Kid, Dave Wilson, O'Fowler, Charlie Beaudry, Tom Pickett, um, a few of them rode into Fort Sumner, and unbeknownst to Billy and his companions, a posse led by dun, 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 Pat Garrett was waiting for them. The posse opened fire, killing um, O'Fallard, and the rest of them escaped unharmed. In December of that year, the governor posted a bounty for $500 for Billy's capture. Um, he was wanted dead or alive. There was no bring him back for justice at this point. Pat continued to search for him, and on December 23rd, there was a siege, and um, Bowdry was killed. Pat and his posse captured Billy, along with Pickett, Rudabaugh, and Wilson at Stinking Springs. The prisoners, including Billy, were shackled and taken to Fort Sumner, and then later on to Las Vegas, New Mexico. And they arrived in Las Vegas on the 26th of December. There were a lot of people... <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me, there are a lot of a crowd, a big crowd and curious onlookers. And the next day before the train could take off, and the train already had Pat and the prisoners on board, there was a, a group of people and a deputy sheriff who stopped the train from leaving and demanded that Dave Rudabaugh be given to them um, because he had shot and killed another deputy. Pat refused to surrender the prisoner and then agreed to let those men accompany him to um, Santa Fe and let the governor decide if they could have Rudabaugh or not. Um, in a later interview with a re reporter, Billy the Kid said he was unafraid during the incident and saying, quote, if I only had my Winchester, I'd lick the whole crowd. The Las Vegas Gazette ran a story from a jailhouse and the interview or the reporter who was interviewing Billy said that he looked very relaxed. And Billy said, quote, what's the use of looking on the gloomy side of everything? The laugh's on me this time. So during his short career as an outlaw, Henry McCarthy, a.k.a. William Bonney, a.k.a. Kid Antrim, a.k.a. Billy the Kid, was a subject of numerous newspaper articles clear as far away as New York City. All right, we're getting down to the nitty gritty of our video here, and I still got lots of things to tell you. <laughs> so they got to Santa Fe. Billy sought out the governor, asking again for that clemency that was promised, and the governor refused to intervene. Billy stood trial in April of 1881 in Mesilla, New Mexico, and after two days of testimony was found guilty of the murder of Sheriff Brady. Billy the Kid is the only person who was ever convicted of, for any of the murders that happened in this Lincoln County War. He was the only one where a conviction was actually sought and secured. On the 13th of April, Judge Warren Bristol sentenced Billy to hang, and that was scheduled for the 13th of May. 
And according to legend, upon the sentencing, the judge told Billy he was going to hang until he was dead, dead, dead. And Billy's response was, reportedly, you can go to hell, hell, hell. <laughs> now, whether or not that's true or just, you know, what people said, we don't really know. Okay, so after he was sentenced, he was Billy was moved back to Lincoln. He was held under guard on the top floor of the town courthouse. And on the evening of the 21st of April, Pat was out of town. And there were two deputies in charge of Billy the Kid and some other prisoners. One deputy took the prisoners, five of the prisoners, across the street for a meal, leaving one deputy and Billy the Kid alone in the jail. Billy asked to be taken outside to use the outhouse. And when they returned, Billy was walking ahead of the deputy. He hit around a corner, slipped out of his handcuffs, and beat Bell with the loose end of the cuffs. Bell was the deputy. During the scuffle, Billy grabbed the deputy's revolver and fatally shot him in the back as he tried to run away. His, Billy's legs were still shackled, so he broke into Pat's office and found a loaded shotgun, and he waited for the other deputy to respond to the gunshots, and when he saw him, he called out the window and said, look up, old boy, and see what you get, and when the deputy looked up, Billy shot and killed him. It took Billy about an hour to free himself from the leg irons with an axe, and then he obtained, a.k.a. stole a horse, and rode out of town. And according to some, he was singing when he left. After Billy escaped, the governor placed a new $500 bounty on his head. And after three months, Pat heard a rumor that Billy was in the vicinity of Fort Sumner. So Pat and two deputies headed toward that area and they were questioning a resident named Pete Maxwell who happened to be a friend of Billy's. Pete was the son of the land baron Lucian Maxwell and Pat sat with Pete and they talked for several hours on that day. Around midnight, the pair sat in Pete's darkened bedroom when Billy unexpected, unexpectedly entered. Um, according to accounts, when they vary, that because of the darkness of the room, Billy entered the room asking Canis, Canis, which means who is it? Um, Pat recognized Billy's voice, drew his revolver and fired twice. The first bullet struck Billy in the chest just above his heart while the second missed. Um, Pat's account leaves it unclear as to whether Billy the kid was killed instantly or whether it took some time for him to die. After, a few hours after the shooting, the local justice of the peace assembled a coroner's inquest, or a coroner's journey, rather, jury, wow, um, six people. The jury members interviewed Pete and Pat, and they viewed the location and Billy's body, and it was certified that the dead man was, in fact, Billy the Kid. Um, and that was what was reported to the local newspaper. Billy was given a wake by candlelight and buried the next day, and his grave was denoted with a wooden marker. Five days after the killing, Pat traveled to Santa Fe to collect the $500 offer or $500 reward from Governor Wallace. Um, William Rich, the acting New Mexico governor, refused to pay the reward. And after over the next few weeks, there were a lot of there's a lot of um ugly feelings about that and and citizens of the territory actually raised over seven thousand dollars in reward money for pat because they felt like the governor should have paid the bounty especially because the former governor had proved it um pat eventually I'm trying to skip a few things here pat felt like he needed to tell his side of the story and he called on his friend um, Marshall Upston, who was a journalist, to ghostwrite a book for him. And it only sold a few, topi a few copies, but it did become the reference for the life of William Henry McCarthy, Henry McCarthy, Kid Antrim, Willie Bonney, and Billy the Kid. So over time, the legend grew that Billy, in fact, had not died in this shootout, that he and Pat had actually become friends. And they concocted the death so that Billy could evade the law. And over the next 50 years, there were a number of men that claimed they were, in fact, Billy the Kid. Most of these um, claims were easily disproven. There were a couple that took a little bit to disprove, but whatever. <laughs> 
The, bur the burial site of William Henry, sorry, it's Patrick Henry McCarthy is a mystery because there was a flood in the cemetery that moved all of the grave markers and headstones. Um, the cemetery workers did their best to place the headstones back on the graves to the best of the records and memory, but it is unknown if it is exactly in the right location. Another funny thing is that Billy the Kid's headstone has been stolen so many times that it is now enshrined in a cage. That is right. The state of New Mexico has erected a cage around the headstone of Billy the Kid in order to prevent it from being taken. So here is the coloring and the finished card. You knew when I got to New Mexico, I was going to have to tell the story of Billy the Kid, or at least I knew. <laughs> this is the only true official picture of Billy the Kid. This one has been computer enhanced. I did find a picture of Pat Garrett, kind of a dashing young man, and a picture of John Tunstall, as well as a picture of the headstone and the cage that is surrounding it. I hope you enjoyed listening to the story of Billy the Kid. Thank you so much for stopping by. I do have a couple of other videos here I think you would like, as well as a subscribe button. If you have not yet subscribed to my channel, I would love it if you did. Leave me a comment down below, leave me a thumbs up, and have a really fabulous day.